how to manage hemorrhage in the smile interface. Use this simple tip to efficiently and effectively stop the bleeding and deliver a perfect visual outcome. In this smile case, the patient has already had their eyes cleaned and prepped and is now underneath the Vismax laser. We see the laser hair about to dock on the cornea, and what I'm not showing you is that I've already confirmed the patient's visual axis in both eyes before starting the procedure. The docking of the laser on the eye may seem a bit decentered here in a minute because it's not on the pupillary axis, but this is very intentional. For smile, the treatment has to be centered on the patient's visual axis, not the pupillary axis. And in myopic patients, this tends to be inferior, nasal, or infranasal. Not always, but most of the time. If we center the treatment on the pupillary axis, we risk a decentered correction of the refractive error, higher order aberrations, and unwanted visual side effects. This first outside in pass of the laser is known as the refractive cut or the lenticule cut. This is what is actually treating the patient's prescription. Next, the side cut in the periphery creates the edges of the lenticule, then this inside out cut creating the cap or the top of the smile pocket. And then finally, the superior incision is made to give us easy access for lenticule extraction. The appearance of that air bubble tells me that the laser settings are pretty optimized and that this is probably going to be an easy lenticule to dissect and extract. The actual lenticule creation just took 24 seconds, and now we move over to the other eye. Now for our international colleagues who perform smile surgery, you might be thinking, that's not what it looks like when I use the laser, and you would be right. Here in the United States, the FDA limits the amount of refractive error that can be treated, the number of incisions that can be made, and the interface architecture. The end result is the same, but there are some slight variations depending on where in the world this smile surgery is being performed. So same thing here, we are centering the cone on the visual axis. Can you guess which eye this is? This is the patient's left eye, and the visual axis is slightly infranasal hair as well. Let's watch and see how that lenticule is created again. In just a second, we're going to see something new that we did not see during the creation of the first lenticule. Again, the outside in refractive cut, and here you can see just superior to the pupil, this dark spot, sometimes called a black spot or black artifact, is indicative of mybum between the aggravating glass cone and the cornea, dry epithelium, or low energy settings on the laser. As long as the black spots are not in the middle of the patient's visual access, they will likely be of no consequence to the patient's final visual outcome. However, if they are central and numerous, it's time to abort the smile surgery and convert to LASIK. And that's why it's really important that the patient's cornea be as pristine as possible before docking with the laser. If anything looks off before starting, release suction, irrigate the cornea, and clean or replace the suction cone. Lots of black artifact portends a sticky dissection, so consider fixating the eye. And as this eye is coming into focus, you'll see a lot of air bubbles in the smile pocket. They're going to make the patient's vision temporarily blurry, but I'm going to use them as a visual cue to aid me in keeping my bearings. Here I use the smile dissector to open up the superior incision, and I tip the instrument anteriorly to delineate the anterior plane. Now I go posterior to the lenticule to define the posterior pocket. And now that I have both the anterior and posterior planes, we can proceed with the dissection. Can you see it? There's already a little bit of oozing near the smile incision. This patient maybe has a little bit of pain superiorly, not uncommon in patients with a long history of wearing contact lenses, and you can see that there are blood vessels traversing the superior cornea and encroaching the smile incision. And as the dissector is being inserted into the pocket, you can see that all the red blood cells are being smeared across the lenticule before it has been extracted. And I'm doing a thorough dissection here. I want to make sure there is no part of the lenticule that stays behind. Note the conjunctiva. There are no subconjunctival hemorrhages. The Vismax is a very gentle laser that aggravates just the cornea, and it doesn't touch the conjunctiva or the sclera, so it's rare to see subconjunctival hemorrhages. Here, the lenticule is just being gently pulled out. You see that comes out nicely. Let's recenter the laser here so we can get a better look. And you can see the lenticule is totally bathed in red blood cells. I'm just going to go ahead and gently smooth out all the edges. I know I have the whole thing out, but this is just good muscle memory and practice to put into effect. I want to make sure with that view being slightly obscured in the pocket that there are no actual tags or remnants of tissue from the lenticule that could get left behind if I'm not careful. And we're smoothing this out nicely and we can see that it is indeed all extracted. So it's great that the lenticule came out all in one piece, but we can't just leave the blood in the interface. So I'm going in here with an irrigation cannula and I'm just going to gently irrigate out all the red blood cells to make sure they don't stay in the pocket. 
Now, for all intents and purposes, let's say a little bit of the blood did stay in the smile interface. It's most likely going to get absorbed on its own, but red blood cells underneath the LASIK flap or in the smile interface can be a risk factor for developing some inflammation or even DLK, diffuse lamellar keratitis. So I just squeegeed out all the fluid that I irrigated the pocket with, and now I'm just taking some Wexel sponges to make sure that I'm smoothing everything out nicely. This eye looks great, but you can tell that there's still a little bit of oozing at the edge of that incision. So I'm going to apply a little bit of mechanical pressure with the Wexel sponge, and that should crimp down on some of those blood vessels. And these sponges are actually made of cellulose, which is actually hemostatic in nature. But here you can see it's still bleeding and capillary action is just gonna pull the blood all the way through that incision, and there's a risk of it cascading into the interface. So I could sit here and hold pressure five minutes, 10 minutes, but it's not really the most efficient or the most effective way to stop the bleeding. I could just leave it and hope for the best, but I'd rather not have to bring the patient back to the laser or irrigate out the pocket at the slit lamp. So I ask my laser technician, who's fantastic, he's seen everything in refractive surgery, he knows exactly where to go to get what I need, I ask him for a Wexel sponge soaked in a vasoconstricting agent, neosinephrine. So I hold pressure here while he's getting that Wexel sponge, and because we're on the same page, because he's been watching the TV screen the whole time, he knows exactly what I need, and here it is, a large Wexel sponge soaked in that neosinephrine, and I'm just going to hold this hair for about 15 seconds, gentle pressure, not doing anything else, just letting the medication take effect. And you'll see that those oozing blood vessels, now with this vasoconstricting agent on them, are going to stop bleeding. And there it is. We put in post-operative drops. You can see that the bleeding has stopped from that incision. But even as I take out this eyelid speculum, even as I remove the tegderm, as the patient is moving their eyes around and squeezing, I'm carefully still paying attention to that incision to make sure that the bleeding doesn't restart. And if it does, I either need to have an irrigation cannula ready to irrigate out the pocket at the slit lamp, or I need to redrape the patient, reinsert the speculum, and apply a little more pressure with neosinephrine. I'll speed up the video here so you can watch the rest of the case while we finish discussing what we just saw. Let's say this was LASIK. It would be easy to lift the flap and just irrigate out all of the red blood cells from underneath it. And this can be done while the patient is still underneath the laser, where it's easy to quickly wash the blood away with the patient in the supine position, or it can be delicately done at the slit lamp microscope as well. Once the flap is smoothed into place with the edges properly aligned, as long as there's not a large gutter, it's pretty hard for blood to get underneath the flap unless some sort of trauma in the first few hours causes the flap to dislodge. Remember, the endothelial cell pump function of the cornea will immediately cause the LASIK flap in the stroma to start to detergest and suction it back into place. But in the case of SMILE, you're dealing with a pocket. There is no flap you can lift to easily wash away the red blood cells. If you irrigate the pocket out at the slit lamp, you're working against gravity, and the SMILE incision at the superior cornea is often covered by the upper eyelid. It can certainly be done at the slit lamp, but ergonomically, it's just easier to take care of underneath the Visimax laser. Two final points. In SMILE, we just have to be concerned about abnormal blood vessels or panis near the superior incision. But in the case of LASIK, the LASIK flap that gets made takes up a lot more surface area of the cornea than does the SMILE incision. So there is a greater potential for not just hemorrhage, but a significant amount of hemorrhage. And so that's why it's really important in the case of bleeding that you take the time to thoroughly irrigate out all of the red blood cells from underneath the flap. Finally, if you think you're going to be in this situation, consider pre-treating prophylactically with neosinephrine, either before the case has started or after the LASIK flap or smile lenticule have been created. So, what do you think? How would you have managed this case? Comment down below and let me know. And for more refractive and cataract surgery content, subscribe. See you next time.